Hey, it's Joel. Many have asked, and it's about time we get down to the review of the Railcore 2 300ZL kit from Project R3D and Railcore Labs. We're gonna do it right here on 3D Printing Nerd. Yes, the Railcore 2 300ZL 3D printer, a printer I first saw at the Midwest RepRap Festival. Maybe that's where you first saw it as well. Since then, Tony has made some changes, upgrades. It's all open source. All the plans are available online. The build materials you can just get and source it yourself. However, Project R3D saw this machine and thought maybe we can do something to help out, which means they collect the parts that you can then buy and it comes as a kit from them. I'm told this is the first kit, and this is the kit that my buddy Robert put together and the kit that I get to review. Let's start with some specs about the machine. I'm gonna read them directly from the website so I don't get anything wrong. It's 300 by 300 by 300, which means it has a very large build volume. It comes with a Duet Wi-Fi and it's paired with the Duet X5. That means that if you're interested in the E3D tool changer, it will take that no problem. It's got a Kinovo heated bed, this one came with the E3D V6 Gold, but it's Slice Mosquito compatible. It's a Bontech BMG extruder up top, aluminum stepper and idler mounts from 713 Maker, aluminum X carriages from Mandela Rose Works. Awesome. Meanwhile, power supply, Ziltec linear rails, 1.8 degree steppers on the Z axis to give it 0.01 millimeters per step, 0.9 degree steppers for X, Y in the extruder. The wiring harness is complete and labeled to keep wiring time to a minimum. And when you buy the kit, all 3D printed parts are included. Printed out of atomic dark cherry PLA and atomic carbon fiber reinforced PETG. I've had the machine for a little while and I've got some thoughts on it, but first let's throw back to when the machine was brought to me and I got to talk to Robert. Hey Robert. Hey Joel, how are Good. you? Doing great. Look at this wonderful machine. So people have asked about this machine ever since I talked about it to, uh, with Tony at Murph and everybody said, Joel, you should build one and I didn't, but you did. Now tell everyone why you built it and not me. So. I built this machine um, because this is the first kit uh, production of this machine. And I had the time to build it and I have the passion about the printer itself. You love you love the hardware end of this stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. I, the assembly and the engineering and the process is really interesting. You did have fun on your Twitch stream, didn't you? I did. We streamed for about 14 and a half hours straight. <laughs> Uh, with no breaks. That's and you had viewers. You had people watching you build this machine the, the entire time. It was it was amazing and it was humbling and it's just it was an awesome experience. Well, in this build, there's three things I really want to ask you about and find out what your experiences were. One is the power side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is the mechatronics because I know it's Core XY, and the third being the hot end. Mm -hmm. So let's let's actually swing it around this way and let's talk about the power box a little bit. Slide those feet. So, I'm going to take these screws out so I can actually show it to you guys. That's a good idea. How many screws to remove the cover? There four? are four. Okay. And they're just uh, 16 mil or I think these are 12 millimeter M3s. Ooh, that's pretty. It looks like you were telling me earlier that the low voltage side is separated from the high voltage side, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, it's, separ it's separated pretty well. All of your high voltage is, and I'm not going to stick my hands in no, it. No, don't do that. Is, is, is right here. You've got your high voltage ins. This is your uh, mains inlet. There's some uh, connectors here. And then the SSR, solid state relay, uh, that powers the heated bed is right here. And you were saying earlier, it's usually it's a, it's a 15 amp SSR? Yeah, so the heated bed is 750 watts and uh, it, a 15 amp SSR would be plenty. The Panasonic SSR that's in this is rated for 60 amps. Okay, so, so that is overkill. It is absolutely overkill. But Which is pretty much the definition of this machine. I <laughs> kind of figured. Okay, so uh, the SSR and then that powers the bed. It can get nice and hot real mm -hmm. quick. Uh, it, well, it is a very, very thick aluminum bed, so it still takes about as long as average, but uh, it's also much more stable because it has that thermal oh. mass. Oh, because it's going to hold on to the heat mm -hmm. like crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on the other side of the, it's a Meanwell, right? Yeah, a it is a power Meanwell. supply. Yeah, it's a Meanwell. It's all name brand parts. So it looks like it's it's running a, a Duet Wi-Fi board mm -hmm. and you and the bottom board is a Duet X. X. Is yeah. that right? So That's it's, correct. What's the difference for those that don't know? 
So the Duet board um, does all of the thinking, and the Duet X is basically uh, um, I/O input output expansion. Um, oh, that's what enables it to allow the three Z motors. Correct. Okay. And that's why the three Zs are actually plugged in down here. Um, this also gives us an extra uh, sense point for a, a second bed temperature probe uh, for thermal protection. Okay. Um, that's not enabled yet, but it is coming in in fairly soon firmware updates. Oh, uh, that's just, once you have the hardware in, that's just software. Correct, it's okay. just software. And it looks like there's plenty of open ports for expansion. You can add all kinds of things to this. Um, you could replace steppers with servos and have actual feedback. You could do things like additional tool heads or things like that in the future. There's okay. so much expandability. It's very clean. Good <laughs> job, Robert. You wire, you move wires and, and route them much better than I would. Yeah, so on the other thing, this kit comes, like this wiring harness here is pre-built. You don't have to build this harness. You don't have to build this harness. It's just, it's, oh. it's pre-wired, pre it's pre-heat shrunk, it's pre-terminated. It's literally like, they're already the right distance. You just the connectors are on it. They're labeled where they go. So you just, it's kind of Lego. Well, that means even I could probably do something like this. Yeah, so it's its not an insanely hard build. It's a very intense build from a, there are a lot of steps and a lot of places you can do something wrong. But if you can follow instructions and you can step by step and you're detail oriented, it's not a difficult build. It's just a little time consuming. Well, let's move from the electronics box. Let's move up top and take a look at the, the Core XY mechatronics. So here's the interesting thing. I was gonna stop camera to move position so we could look at it from top down, but then Robert shows off the sturdiness of the machine by tilting it on its side. Can you print on its side? I suspect you could. I don't think it would have any issues printing no? on its side. And I think that might be something you should try. That might be kind of fun. Okay, so this is a Core XY system. And for those that don't know, can you explain the difference between this and a standard Cartesian machine? Sure, so your X and Y are not directly tied to X and Y. They're tied to both X and Y. So this is Y and this is X. And if you look, if you turn Y, you'll notice it moves in both X and Y. Is it like an, e an Etch-a-Sketch? Yes, it moves just like an Etch-a-Sketch. Both of the steppers work together to make shapes. You'll notice I get, um, I get one direction. Yeah. And then if I, which is a little more hard to do with your brain, <laughs> if you turn them <laughs> opposite directions, yep, you, get, you, you get you your get other it. axis. But if you turn them both, uh, if you just turn one, you get a diagonal. Yeah, you get the diagonal, okay. It's as if an Etch-a-Sketch was opposite. Mm -hmm. I like that. So then with this machine here, you have the Core XY system. It's on linear rails. Uh, most people are gonna say, are they high wind rails? Are they? These are not high wind rails. Um, R3D sourced these specifically because they are high quality rails at a much more cost effective price point. This machine's not putting any significant stresses on the rails. So high winds are known for their super high level of quality. These are all QC checked before they go out. They are cleaned and greased and they move smoothly when you get them. I didn't have any trouble with them at all. That's great to hear. And for the Z, uh, is there anything that we need to know? Because the Z is on three different linear rails as well. So, so bed movements are smooth, obviously. Bed movements are really smooth, but the three Z screws is sort of the signature thing about this printer. Um, most printers, when they bed level um, and they, they create a mesh bed level, they're, me they're leveling the Z axis and they're just doing it in software, whereas they move across a slightly unlevel bed, they're either raising or lowering the Z just a little bit. Mm -hmm. This machine, what it does when it levels the bed is it goes around and it probes all of the points. And then because it has individual access at three points, it can physically level the bed. So it is true level instead of mesh level. Wow, it's so, oh, 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 oh my God. Oh Christ. Uh, yeah, oh, true ooh, level. Oh. I did a bed level test and point one was 0 0.000 millimeters off, point two was 0, 0.00 meter, millimeters off, point three was 0, 0.000 millimeters off. And, and that enables you to print remarkably thin layers at extremely fast speeds. So the last thing I really wanna focus on as far as the build and, and what's in there is the head mm -hmm. itself. So just for the sake of, of making sure <laughs> everything's fine, let's flip it back up. I'll move the camera and then we'll, we'll take a look. The hot end, everything at the top. If I'm if I'm seeing things correctly, you've got a Bontech extruder. Mm -hmm. 
linked to a piece of Capricorn tubing. Correct. Going into what I would assume to be an E3D V6. It is the E3D V6 Gold Edition. Gold. What makes it? What is the Gold Edition? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. It does have. Uh, it does come with a hardened steel nozzle. Okay. Um, so you can already go ahead and print things like. Uh, so I can send nice chewy things you through can. this. Okay. It is actual E3D. Uh, stepper motors on both the X, Y, and extruder. Uh, okay. They're 0.9 degree steppers. Okay. That's how they get some of the, the really intense accuracy. The whole hot end assembly is 3D printed. It's got a bunch of brass inserts. All of that has to be done during the assembly. So you okay. actually melt the brass in inserts into the parts. Um, they have really good instructions on how to do that. People are going to tell me 3D printed parts on this machine. What are you doing? Those won't stand up to it. Or is that something that people need to be worried about? Not at all. Um, the few parts that are structural that need to be really rigid are. Um, there's no load on, on the, not enough load on this to matter. Okay. And then for bed leveling, let's see on the other side. Let's see if I can't turn this even just a little bit. There we go. That thing right there. Yep. That optical sensor. So that for bed leveling, it's not like a BL touch. Correct. It's not a pin to probe? It's not. It doesn't it's not make, inductive. It, it doesn't make physical contact with the with the bed, but it also doesn't matter what the material is, with the exception of it has to be able to see it. Okay. So it might not be able to see glass. Would PEI work? PEI should work. Okay. Um, anything that's uh, not transparent should be okay. Oh, so like PEI is semi-translucent. Right. It, it, it can, it's, there's still something there to see? If your mouse can see it, this can see it. That's good to know. I want you to see this. This Benchy right here was printed at what? 75 millimeters a second. And this isn't some pretend, I mean, this is legit 75 yes. millimeters per second at what layer height? 0 0.2. 0 0.2. Most Benchies that you print at 0 0.2, you're not printing at 75 millimeters a second. And if you are, you have yourself a highly customized or well-built personal machine. But look at, I want you to see the bow of this boat. Look at that. That is... That is seven shades of amazing right there. Usually the bow is going to be one of those things where cooling doesn't happen correctly and it folds up on itself and it looks kind of icky, but this doesn't look icky at all. I like this, but here's one other thing. This is what's called the king's hand, is that Correct. right? This is the king's hand. And what layer height is this printed at? So that was printed at 0 0.02 millimeter layers. 0 0.02. Two at what speed? 75 millimeters a second. It looks good. It looks really good. It looks really, really good. Like we're, we're getting to the point where this machine could print models that rival injection molded. Correct. Right? Because um, 0 0.02, that's, and you're laying down so little plastic at that point that it's it's almost like wizardry. Well, and, and some of the interesting things, there are other machines out there that can print really low layer heights but they can't do it at these speeds. Right. Uh, and that's a function of the fact that the bed is supremely level. It's true. It, it's yes. true level. Yep. Yeah, true level. One more, let's, let's, let's show this off. That is uh, the Sir, Serpinski's Triangle? Sir, Serpinski's Triangle. Serpinski's that's, that's Triangle, right. okay, I can't believe I got that right. Printed at 75, right? 75 as well. 75. Uh, it does slow down minute. slightly on the very, very top because it needs time for cooling, but that's okay. the only reason it has to slow down. Well, I want you to talk about the cooling as well because the fan on it is crazy, and you're saying for PLA, fan needs to be at 25% max? Yeah, uh, there were times I was running about 28%, but uh, that was just for, t for tweaking and, and, and playing. Most of the time I run somewhere between 18 and 25%. Okay, for PLA? For PLA. At 75 millimeters per second? Correct. Okay, this is fun. Well, I'm really looking forward to playing this with this machine. Uh, this machine, I don't get to keep. This is just something I get to use and yep. send off on its merry way. I believe Adam gets this one. Yep. However, you get a different beast. I want you to talk a little bit about what you get. So this is the first kit. Um, there is another version of this printer that is a what they call a ZLT. The T stands for tall. Tall. And it is twice as tall. It is 300X by 300Y by 600Z. And it's capable of the exact same performance. So it's, it's literally double the Z mm -hmm. with no degradation in performance. Correct. I can print something that's 600 millimeters tall at 0.02 layer heights and it only takes a month. Yeah, for the first couple layers and right. then you know. Well, and at 75 millimeters a second, it doesn't really take that long. This King's Hand, this King's Hand piece right here, it only took about four hours. At 0.02. At, point, at 0.02. That's not bad. And it's almost solid. The infill on that is like 80%. If That's impressive If you flip, if you flip it itself. over, you can actually see the infill. Oh. Oh, I see. I don't know if the camera can pick that up. But yeah, it's dark, so you might not yeah. see it. But.
A big thanks again to Robert for bringing this machine by, and you'll have it back in no time. Again, it's not my machine. I have to give it back. First, let's talk about the giant pile of stuff on the inside. When you're testing a machine, and it's not something that has a printer profile that's been tuned and easily available, you have to, well, if you're going to make a cake, you got to crack some eggs. And crack some eggs, we did. This is actually the third pile like this because I had three total piles of failed prints in this machine just from testing over and over and over again. There we go, a nice, fresh, clean machine. Before we get into my thoughts on the machine, let's actually explore the models that I have right here and talk about them. Right off the bat, this Space City. This was printed in Atomic uh, Starry Night PLA, I think it was, and it looks great. I don't think I had the slicer profile down perfect because it was a little stringy, but the angles and the, the organic shapes and the overhangs are just perfect. It is, it is an example of what this machine is truly capable of. I know I tweeted about this or put it on uh, Instagram. This is the Flowalistic kind of 3D printed chain mail. This was printed in Strong Hero 3D PLA. The machine did a great job with this. And what was really cool is I just wanted to test retractions and the ability to retract, and it had no problem whatsoever. The, the chainmail prints down like this, and it has to go into dots over and over and over again. And it just worked. I had a most a somewhat tuned profile that I got from, I believe, the Facebook group, and uh, it worked. <laughs> it worked really well. You may remember a video where my son and I made scooter stands, and these two scooter stands were printed on the rail core. Uh, the scooter stands themselves, uh, this is PLA, this is PLA, and they, they printed great, no problems. The walls look good, everything is strong. Uh, I, I thought they turned out great, and the rail core did a really good job. Can't have a test print without having a maker coin, and this is sized up a little bit bigger. This is Proto Pasta's, I think Tom's orange, it's the orange that he made. I really like this filament. It's got some glitter in it. And this, the model's, per, other than a little bit of stringingness, the, the, the model's perfect. I did have some Proto Pasta Carbon Fiber HTPLA, and I, I wanted to print out some of these little, little vases here. Uh, they, they look great as well. It's vase mode, so it's, it's really easy to usually produce something that looks good. It looks like there was a little bit of wobble at the top, but otherwise the prints turned out decent. These are gift quality i like i would i would plant a little succulent in one of these and give it as a gift easily i did have issues uh one of the prints failed because there was a jam in the hot end uh, i cleared the jam and was able to print again so i i don't know what was happening but maybe we'll we'll talk about the hot end and the the cooling ability here at the end also, you may remember when my editor, Sean, was over here and we 3D printed the Power Rangers blaster. Uh, these are pieces that we printed on the rail core. Remember, I think in the video we had talked about pieces that didn't turn out so well. These turned out great. Uh, this, is, this is just PLA. Uh, before, we didn't have a proper profile. When we had a proper profile and we were able to print these pieces, other than some just kind of stringiness, which I guess you're sensing is a pattern with what I'm doing here. They, t they turned out great. These parts are better than the ones that I think we printed for the, for the actual blaster that Sean has at home. Sorry about that, Sean. I'll keep these safe for you. What's a 3D printer test without a few mascots? We've got Sir Layers a lot. I've got a 3D fill and another 3D fill. I think that um, this one is probably one of the better ones. Uh, the Sir Layers a lot. These were... Uh, printed with two different profiles. This was one and then you could tell there was a, a little bit of zits, a little bit of, of uh, stringing, just a tiny, tiny little bit. Then I changed the profile and printed this one and uh, it was a bit more stringing, but the model I thought turned out better. This is uh, Atomic Starry Night. Same one as that right there. This 3D fill, this is interesting. This is Nylon 230. It's split. I'm trying to figure out why. Uh, I was able to print a vase mode nylon little vase, little pot, and it worked great. Um, I did attempt to print this scooter stand in the nylon on this machine 
whereas I actually had to move it over to the Prusa machine to print with because I couldn't get the nylon would uh, jam or it would just it wouldn't stick well to itself. Here's a GoPro mount and and you can tell it's just it's in pieces. Normally nylon stick to itself really well. I dried the nylon and tried and still same thing. So I don't know what was going on. Um, you may find some tips for nylons in there. I thought maybe because of the overhang, the nylon was curling up a little bit and the, it didn't have the, the ability to stick to itself. But if you take these two pieces separately, like this part of the 3D fill is strong. It's nylon strong. And so are the feet. It just so happens the little connection point right here didn't seem to work. Nylons were difficult for me on this machine and I don't know exactly why. The same models that I would print on this machine actually worked on the Prusa using the same temperatures, the, the same print speeds and the same uh, bed temperatures, layer heights, all that stuff. So I, I don't know what was going on. I'm guessing it was still something I was doing or something in the configuration of the machine. So I'm willing to bet if I had more time, I could probably get nylons printing, no problem. Here's a metallic PLA print uh, of that pot, very similar. You saw this in Protopasta's carbon fiber PLA. This is, I believe, a, a Protopasta brass or, or bronze fill, I believe. And uh, it turned out great as well. Uh, you, you can see that there's these layering, these gradients of layers when you look at it from the side. Uh, I think that has to do with the model and not necessarily uh, the, an extrusion issue because these these curls and these organic shapes, these underhangs, these overhangs, they're perfect. So uh, I think this is the model and it's not indicative of a problem with the extruder. So where does it leave us with this machine? Uh, let me first start with some of the things that I wasn't necessarily a fan of. The blower on this kit uh, is way overpowered for what it needs to be. If I ran the fan for filament cooling above 30%, then nothing would work because it would cool the filament faster than the ability of, for it to stick to itself. And so layers would just delaminate. And that's not what happened with the nylon prints because I didn't have the fan enabled for the nylon prints, just in case you were asking. I think a kit should come with an appropriate filament cooling fan. And this one is just a bit overpowered. The auto bed leveling is fantastic on this. With the three stepper motors on Z, it allows you to level the bed to exactly perpendicular to the nozzle, which means the nozzle isn't, isn't plowing or trailing or dragging filament. It's laying it down. And that's why you're able to achieve incredible detail with models. But the problem is it's an IR sensor and some people like it, some people don't. I think that uh, I would rather have a BL touch or a mechanical solution for bed leveling because I've tried uh, BuildTech, I tried Gecko Tech material, uh, I tried and what's on there currently is a Wham Bam Systems removable flex plate. The IR sensor is going to have difficulty unless your build surface is entirely opaque. Uh, I did have to do adjustments when I was using Gecko Tech because the IR sensor couldn't pick it up perfectly. But I think a mechanical solution for bed leveling is, in my opinion, better. That may not be everybody's opinion, but that's what I think it needs. All right, what do I think about this? This is probably one of the harder questions I've had to answer myself. I know it's a printer and I know I'm reviewing a printer, but it feels like a group of really good ideas. Like Tony's idea and, and whoever was involved in creating this came up with incredibly good solutions for problems that we face in 3D printing. And the, the solutions they came up with allow this machine to print at crazy layer heights at incredible speeds, which means that we're going to be able to make parts with this machine that are closer to injection molding than with typical 3D printers. And those parts are going to be able to be made faster. While there were some things that I think the machine needed to change, those things were very few. Otherwise, this is, in my opinion, the king of 3D printer kits. 
Now, is this printer for you? Eh, maybe. This is not a first 3D printer. This is not a printer to cut your teeth on. This is what you get when you know exactly what you want and you know exactly what you need because this machine, though it is a kit, it is still an advanced kit. Uh, you are tapping holes. You are, unless you get it from Project R3D, you are assembling wiring bundles. You may be soldering, I don't know. But in the end, you have to remember that this arrives in a box as a bunch of parts and it's up to you to put it together. I have assembled kits before and I think the Prusa i3 kit is an example of a kit done really, really well for the consumer market. In fact, a Prusa kit I could recommend as a first 3D printer for someone who has some technical ability. This machine, once you have your Prusa or your Creality or your, your first printer, once you have your Ender 3 that you've cut your teeth with, you've got it dialed in, you've done some mods and you're ready for an upgraded experience and you save your pennies, this is what you get. This right here. This is the king of 3D printer kits, hands down. If you can show me another 3D printer kit for $1,500 US that's able to print at 300 by 300 by 300, that's E3D tool changer compatible, that comes with all these upgraded components, that's able to produce parts that look like they may have been injection molded. If it's out there, I don't know of it unless it's this. Well, there we go. That's my review of the Project R3D kit for the Railcore 2 300ZL 3D printer. If you agree or not, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hug each other more. I love you guys. As always, high five.